chairman and uh, Partridge and uh, a couple of others for coming. But uh, it's great to see so many of you here and welcome to the State House and I hope your day goes well. Um, Tom, you want to start, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll get right with it so we can get you folks all in one speech. I'm uh, Representative Bach from uh, Chester. I represent the towns of Chester, Handler, Baltimore, and part of Marshall. Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strong from Albany. I represent Albany, Barton, Prattsbury, Greensboro, Lover, Sheelock, Sheelock, Sheffield, and Wheelock. <laughs> so that's a whole Northeast kingdom. <laughs> I'm Representative Bugard. I My towns include Highgate, Franklin, Richford, and my town of Berkshire, where I am on the Farm to School Board. Uh, Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and White. Good morning, everyone. I'm Senator Ruth Hardy, and I represent Addison, the Addison District, which has 26 towns. <laughs> uh, Senator Chris Pearson from Chicken County. Uh, Bobby Starr, I chair the Senate Ag Committee and I represent Orleans, Essex County. So I know I hurt your feelings, but it's 42 communities. I'll just say I'm um, the House Agriculture and Forestry Chair. Uh, Carolyn Partridge is testifying before the um, Education Committee, so she'll be here soon, I think. I'm John Bartholomew. And I represent Hartley, Windsor, and West Windsor. I'm Anthony Blaine, the Senator from Washington County. Brian Collamore, Senator from Rutland County. John Bryan, Representative from Tunbridge and Royal Ten. Um, it was my predecessor, Rosa McLaughlin, who's this, this act is named after. Thank you, folks. And uh, Rose, uh, yeah, that's a good uh, Hey, good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Betsy Rosenbluth. I'm the project director of Vermont Feed at Children Farms and coordinator of the Vermont Farm to School Network. I'm going to be super quick today, um, but happy, of course, always to answer questions um, because you have an amazing array of speakers from various schools across the state and farms um, who are eager to share their story with you. Um, I do just want to sort of lay out um, all the ways this year that um, we can support the growth of Farm to School to all Vermont communities. The strength of our Vermont Farm to School grants program has been this combination of technical assistance, direct funding, and coaching with schools in order to build staying power so that the programs live on past the grant period. And a lot of um, it's worked in our evaluation that the programs continue at the end of the grant period and the programs, of course, like any school program, will go up and down a bit, but um, we have been able to show that building that capacity within the school has been very positive for sustaining the programs. Our goal for Farm to School in Early Childhood is $500,000 a year so that we can continue to grow Farm to School to every school and early childhood site. And demand for the grants from schools and early childhood providers continues to grow, and the work of the network continues to deepen and have a tangible impact on schools and local producers. So this year, the governor's budget um, has a reduction of $50,000. Um, from last year's level of 241000 So the last couple of years, the legislature has restored that $50,000 reduction with one-time funding. Um, we're hoping at some point that that becomes the baseline and that if it's possible to continue to work our way towards our $500,000 goal, um, that would help us to serve more schools. Even small amounts of money allows more providers, more schools to get support. In addition, um, the local purchasing incentive bill, S-273, will inc increase the amount of local food served in school meal programs and support Vermont farms and our local economy. 
for the grant program with that bill will support schools to be able to make that transition to more purchasing. Um, we understand the Agency of Education testified last week in support of the bill, but with some concerns um, to address about the administrative burden. So we certainly support um, the effort to make the implementation of the program as efficient as possible um, and feel that it's essential to keep that funding tied to local purchasing in schools so that the additional money goes to our farmers and our local economy, that win-win approach to farm to school. Um, and lastly, we're excited about the Universal School Meals Bill, H812 and S223. Um, what we have seen in the 25% of Vermont schools currently providing universal school meals is that the model has led to more student participation in the meal program, which brings in more federal reimbursement dollars, more efficiencies in terms of feeding more kids with that greater participation, um, and that has led to more local purchasing. So in fact, a UVM study found that 64% of schools providing universal school meals were purchasing more local food as a direct result of shifting to the universal model. So all of this work together, it, it all works together to create this change in Vermont. So thank you for your ongoing support of Farm to School. We hope to see you between 4 and 6 today up in the cafeteria. There's student displays. There's some speakers. Um, and um, many of the students, Berlin Elementary, will be joining us shortly. Did they just walk in? Um, they're on their way. Um, so we'll be up hopefully in the cafeteria at lunchtime. And um, we're happy any of the speakers to take some questions afterwards or chair if you'd like questions at the end, whatever. Are there any questions for that too at this time? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Laura? Good morning. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, for the record, Laura Ginsberg, Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, Section Chief for the Ag Development Division. So the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets is proud of all of our farm to school grantees, the numerous partners who have helped move this critical work forward, and the national recognition our state receives as a result of its commitment to farm to school programming. Since 2007, after the passage of the Rosen McLaughlin Farm to School Act, we have awarded 128 grants totaling $1.4 million, funding projects at 176 schools and 45 early childhood centers. This has had a combined impact on nearly 52,000 students. And if you look at this year's report, which was passed out earlier on page three, you'll find a lovely map of all of the program grantees showing the wide range of these dollars across the state. Every year we receive more requests for funds than what we have available. Grantees are able to use funds for a variety of projects, the most common being garden supplies, local food, kitchen, cafeteria supplies, professional development, um, and sometimes a farm to school coordinator position. As cultural awareness of food systems and impacts on food choices grows, farm to school programming is well positioned to be the connector from rural economies to the cafeteria. School leadership, students, and parents all note the positive impacts of serving local foods, from increasing student engagement through hands-on learning to increasing school meal participation rates. Early childhood education centers are the most recent addition to our farm to school program, and they have joined in with enthusiasm and engagement. Early childhood centers funded by the grant program have taken a whole family, whole community approach. The more direct interaction with families has allowed for innovative expansion of services offered, such as on-site food pantries stocked with local produce, cooking classes, and parent education. Young children are also introduced to a wide variety of foods, developing their palate and planting the seed of good eating habits. Vermont has a mature and successful program because of well-organized, coordinated, and a robust network of public and private organizations. The technical assistance provided by these organizations is a critical aspect of the grant program, ensuring that all schools have access to the resources and information they need to meet their goals. Technical assistance helps grantees develop holistic programs that through coordinated efforts address multiple goals throughout the community, the classroom, and the cafeteria. 
Schools often report that coaching helps keep them motivated, on task, allows staff to develop meaningful connections in their region, and is vital to the success of their program. Schools receive technical assistance on a wide variety of topics, but generally focusing on procurement, increasing meal participation rates, curriculum, and school gardens. Farm to School continues to be relevant, particularly as rural communities are in a period of change. Supporting Farm to School means supporting the state's ag economy, developing interest in ag as a career, and giving kids opportunities to eat nutritious foods grown in Vermont. This program is a win for all who are involved. Thank you for your time today and all of your Farm to School commitments, and I know that you're going to enjoy hearing from the students who joined us today. And I'm happy to take questions now, or I'm going to stay through the whole session. Uh, questions? Uh, yes. Uh, just looking at the map, and it seems like Essex County is kind of fully. Is that a, is there a reason for that, or is it just? There are a few applications from Essex County. We are working with service providing organizations to develop schools to get ready for applications in that area. And so we, I think we have a commitment over the past year or two years to looking at areas that are underserved by farm to school grants and increasing our outreach and work through the service providers to increase application rates from those areas. So I would say that that is not actually um, uncommon for our grant programs. If you look at like the Working Lands grant map as well, there's, it seems like Essex County has, is a little bit of, um, off the norm for applications, and so that is something that we are aware of at the Agency of Ag and working really hard to change. It's yeah. up to them, it's not something you are. Right, we can only. You're not just cutting them out, right? Right, we can only um, give them a grant if they apply, and so if they don't apply, then unfortunately we can't consider them. So we're working on developing their ability to even write a proposal. They just independent thinkers. If you look at that post, there's six uh, different uh, communities up there, I think. And <clears throat> Canaan, which is a larger, most populous, uh, one of the most populous towns, way up in the Kremlin, near in there, Island Pond's in there, Concord is in there from down south, uh, Lunenburg's in there. Yeah, I don't, I don't let those communities slip. <laughs> I keep tabs on it. Uh, so, any other questions for the board? Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll move to David Baker, the yeah. superintendent. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'll, I'll keep my testimony brief. My name is David Baker, and I'm the superintendent of schools in Windsor, Southeast Supervisory Union, representing the towns of Heartland, uh, Wethersfield, West Windsor, and Windsor. I've been there eight years, and I've been a Vermont administrator for 39 years, and I love this state, and I love the way that we have this kind of interaction, which you don't have everywhere. Uh, I hail from Rhode Island originally, and Certainly these kinds of things, as wonderful as that little state is, they don't happen the way they happen here. So we just need to be very proud of what we do. I don't get out very often, um, and so I don't get to speak much, and that might be to your distinct advantage. Uh, but I, I will try to keep this brief. I do come out, though, and I think that there's something that impacts <clears throat> locally where there have been good partnerships formed, and that's why I'm here on, the part of, uh, on behalf of the Vermont Department of Agriculture, Vermont Feeds, Farm to School, um, and, and Hungry Free Vermont, uh, because those agencies in tandem have just done such an excellent job, I think, of, of integrating the work and working at the local level with all of us to provide not only those financial resources through the grants, but also that coaching and technical assistance, which is so critical. I can't take credit for the initial piece of, of, of Farm to School uh, that happened in my district. Uh, it was alive and well in one of our schools when I got there. Uh, in Heartland, a matter of fact, because Heartland, uh, as John can tell you, uh, uh, has uh, the distinct privilege of having several folks who are very familiar with the Vermont Department of Ag and sat on some of these agencies. And so Heartland got off to an early start and was one of the first recipients of some of the school-to-work uh, money. 
But what happened was, much like with any good coaching and technical assistance and staff development, it just began to, to, to mushroom out. Uh, our supervisory union, uh, albeit through some of uh, the Act 46 process, as a matter of fact, we're, you know, we're one of the success stories, I think, of Act 46. Our supervisory union stayed intact, and I, and, and I don't know how much any of you had to do with staying strong with that, but uh, I, I appreciate that, and I think Windsor Southeast has, has benefited from that because we do work together, and we try to spread the wealth. So a lot of what happened in Heartland initially then got spread out to, to Windsor and Wethersfield and, and and West Windsor to the point where we were able to, through some of the incentive work and coaching work that went on, hire a supervisory union-wide uh, farm to school uh, coordinator. And, uh, and so some of those teams that were happening in that little building then began to expand to the larger building. So that's exactly what we want to see, right? We want that seed money to then grow. And so consequently, now those community gardens, those uh, community dinners, uh, the emphasis on nutrition, the curriculum work, it's really happening in all of our buildings. And there's an investment, I think, in all of our buildings, so much so that our communities decided, two of our communities, Wethersfield and Heartland, decided to embark on a pretty, I, I think, a pretty ambitious move from, from a corporate control of our food services program to a self-operational uh, uh, food. And that's why Craig's here, because last spring we hired Craig to pilot that in Wethersfield and Heartland. And the, particip the participation rates have gone up tremendously. Uh, uh, our breakfast program and breakfast after the bell programs have grown tremendously. But more importantly, that cafeteria, or dining hall, as Craig likes to say it, as the largest classroom in the building, has actually spread uh, the word throughout, throughout the building. So much so that our newly merged district, Mount Escutney, Windsor and West Windsor, are going to go self-operational next year. So we're going to integrate that whole notion of local product, local purchasing, uh, high levels of nutrition, uh, ed education, and trying to provide good, healthy meals for all of our kids throughout the entire supervisory union. None of that would have happened without the technical assistance and coaching and, and, and financial incentives from the Vermont Department of Ag and all of these agencies that we hear today uh, to basically uh, support. Um, so I will turn it over to Craig. Uh, he will probably speak more from the heart than the head because he believes so strongly in delivering uh, the right message to our kids and to our communities. But I want to tell you that what's going on is working, and I would suggest that we at least level fund these programs. We take a strong look at the local purchasing incentive. I don't know if that's in this committee right now, but I tell you that is that is critical to the work that we're doing. And Craig will talk more about that local purchasing piece as he speaks to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Craig Lucarno, Food Service Director for Windsor Southeast Supervisor Union. Um, I am a Vermonter, so there is hope for Windsor. Um, <laughs> And I'm passionate about school food service. I'm passionate about farm to school. Um, I've been in it for a good amount of time. And as a chef coming out of the restaurant industry into school food service, farm to school has given me the ability to promote our programs to hire um, a different level of people because we're emphasizing something grander than just school food service, slop and go. We're, we're looking at a program that's educational, that we can um, reach out to community. Farmers, producers, bring them, be, have them be a huge part of our school and our food program. Um, that is the best, that is this whole um, local purchasing um, bill is essential for successful food programs and educating our future on how to eat properly, support local farmers, understand the importance of eating, um, yeah, eating locally, the difference between local carrots and commodity carrots, 
able to allow them to go to the farmers markets in the summers and understand what asparagus looks like and tastes like. Um, when the school bus drives by Deep Meadow Farm in Weathersfield, they understand where their beets and their lettuce and their cabbage is coming from. So that's really the core of our school food service program. And it is, you know, 5 to 100,000 is the goal. It should be a million. Um, because, you know, as we know, as being a Vermonter and listening to the, the stuff that's going on in the legislature, the money, you know, a million dollars to fund education for our help um, food education for our children. It's a lifestyle change. It's eating healthy. It's supporting local. It's only going to help the benefits of it's a life lesson that they can learn from. You're, you know, a good percentage of kids don't love going to math and English and science. They like going to recess and lunch. <laughs> so why not fund that more so we can educate them more to continue to build our economy in the state of Vermont? So it only makes sense. So, I mean, I could go on all day long, but I think it's really important that funding farm to school in an initiative like local purchasing and supporting, um, you know, I was just sitting by Angus and he's a local farmer and talking to him about what is local. And I believe in his idea of supporting the local farmer that, you know, hood is not always the most local um, purchasing that we should be focused on. We should be sporting the smaller player also. So um, I really hope that we can, and the other piece of it too is that we're, we're about to put in law a recycling and composting program in July. And that's a real big piece of the food service and education also that we just kind of take for granted that we just, it's going to happen. But it is also a big piece of the circle of food service because where that compost is coming from is the waste in the dining hall and we need to educate them also. So it all, we got to look at the, we got to start at the bottom and look at the core necessity and then we can worry about all the other stuff that goes with it. So I really hope that we uh, focus on the importance of this and move it forward. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Craig, uh, we, we can answer questions later if you want or, or whatever. And I will tell you that Craig does walk the walk. We've gone from 5% uh, to about 25% local purchasing right now. So including buying two local cows, uh, and it's worked out. Craig asked if we could put them in my office. I said no, but, uh, but, but that's it. But he does, they graze out in the back, and we, we use them. But it's, it's been great. It really has been. We have two cows. Well, not anymore, because some of them are right here. So I'll just give you, I'll just give you an idea of local purchasing. And every, a lot of people say, well, it's more expensive. It is not more expensive. It's about building relationships with our local farmers. I bought a cow, 850 pounds, $2.40 a pound. You can't buy red slime commodity beef for that. So it works. It's, it's working. So. Uh, Chris, I have a question. You, um, I'm one of the sponsors of the Local Food Initiative uh, Incentive. And one of the barriers or challenges that comes up uh, and is a concern at the Agency of Ed is documenting your local, you know, the budget that is dedicated to local foods and whether or not they'll be able to audit that or, or sort of monitor that. So can you just talk about, you just said that you're, you're approaching 25%. Uh, we've heard that the distributors are, can be a challenge in that dynamic because they may, they may be in fact be bringing you local apples, but they don't label it that way. Can you just help us understand some of the experience that you guys have been through that gives you the confidence to say that you're getting a quarter of your 
Yeah, for, first, uh, and Craig can answer this, I'll just give you the quick answer from, from where I sit and what I've learned from Craig. For us, local means really local. So what, what, what Craig did is he went to a local Wethersfield farmer for the cow, right? Or he goes to a local uh, uh, um, uh, produce uh, uh, production, to, to, to apples, for example. So we would be able to, through those invoices and through those documents, be able to clearly document you know, what, what's local. And what we would have to do is make sure that those vendors, if we were going to use a vendor, split. Uh, split it out so we knew exactly what it is. And quite frankly, you know, they would need to do that because that's how we're going to get incentivized. But I'll tell you, it's worked for us. And I think it's worth a good, strong look at how that works. And I will tell you right now, whether it's five, the carrots or the apples or the local maple, we have all local maple syrup, that's supporting our industries in that local area. And I think there's no better match than, 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 that, than that piece of legislation to kind of get the economy going and to get the local schools going and to get the kids educated. So I think I, I think that brings up a good point and, and a point that we spoke about also with Angus was local is local, regional is regional. So the, the beauty of small town school food service in Vermont is that we're able to build those relationships and I can go sit at the kitchen table at Clay Hill Farm and have coffee with a guy and talk about what we're going to pay for and I can go to Wellwood Orchards in Springfield or Wethersfield and talk to the lady and say you know I'm going to buy this amount of apples for this amount of time and you're going to give me the price of 20% off because I'm going to come get them, right? So we have to procure everything, as you know, in school food service. So it's just another procurement piece. So with a local, you know, purchasing incentive, we need, I would set it up as this is, you, you put in procurement you and you, it's just a, it's another line on a spreadsheet and say I bought my, you know, Wellwood Farm, I bought, 10 cases of apples for $28 a bushel, and I bought, you know, and it just go down the line. I think it's important because I, you know, I have this conversation, and, I, and I'm not always the biggest fan when I say this, but hood is, yes, it is a percentage of it is local, but more local is um, um, Kingdom Creamery, right? Or, or, or Richard, yeah, or um, Mayor, uh, McNamara Farm in Plainfield, New Hampshire. Those people are local. West Farm is local. West, um, Deep Meadow Farm is local. So it's building those relationships, going out and, and saying, I'm going to buy 2,000 pounds of carrots from you from September to November or till February. And that's easily documented. The, the tricky part is going through Reinhardt and saying, I'm buying a local apple, and you're never, and, and you know, Reinhardt just sold out to the second biggest company in the country, in the world. So I don't know if, and I'm probably, I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm gonna say it anyways, because I'm kind of honest. Um, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I think maybe you put some language in there that it is local purchasing and it's a hundred mile radius and you're dealing with the farmer and building relationships with farmers that are going to benefit them, the economy, the community, and the school. And that's how we do it. But I applaud you for putting it on the table. John, you have a question? Yeah, I was looking at your brochure and it says 81% of Vermont schools have school gardens. How many divert food scraps into those gardens, or even legally, can they do that? It's going to be a universal recycling. Well, I don't. Know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think that's our brochure, but but but, but, that's but we do we do. State, yeah. yeah, that's a state brochure, but yeah, and we do do some of that. And quite frankly, I, I I would not want to answer that without looking closely at the at the composting requirements that are coming up. I don't know whether it's legal or not. I know that up until the last couple of years, a lot of our local, local farmers have been grabbing our, our compost and taking it out. So we're hoping that some of that can continue as we move forward. But the gardens have been strong. Compost is always a challenge. Um, it requires a, a lot amount of time from the maintenance folk 
Um, it creates critters that nobody wants to deal with on school grounds. Um, so, you know, I was in Linden for nine years. I built a pretty quality farm to school program in Linden, and we had a, an amazing farm to school program with 48 raised beds and a full working greenhouse, and we had a compost, but that's a full time commitment. So, I don't know if it's I know in Heartland and Weathersfield currently we do not have compost on premise. Right, so. Yeah. Um, so it's it's legal, um, and it, unless there was a an enormous amount of food scrap generated, which I don't know of any K through 12 schools in the state would generate enough for them to be considered a kind of a regulated Sorry. small regulated child waste. Yeah, yeah. There is, none of the schools that are that are K through yeah. 12 that I'm aware of would would produce so much that it would need to be regulated like That's that. That's good it's, to know. It's totally legal. Yeah. Uh, a quick question uh, for you, David. <clears throat> Have you ever figured out how much it would actually cost the taxpayers within your district if the food program went right through the school budget? You know, how much would would you get out of the state aid formula, and how much would it actually cost your local taxpayers to, uh, yeah. to cover that? So, so you mean it would be part of the general fund rather than a separate entity through? Yeah. yeah no, we, we haven't done that analysis, but it, but it'll be an interesting analysis, and I think I think that uh, what we have found, which is interesting, is that when we moved from corporate to local and self-op, because everybody always says how much more expensive it is to do self-op. We haven't necessarily found that. I, I think that's just kind of a, you know, it, it, it's out there, and I, I, maybe it depends on how you do it, but I will tell you that our budget, actually our total budget, food budget, since we've moved, has gone down. <laughs> Can you talk to my superintendent? Uh, I'll just manage him too. I'm yeah. dead serious. Yeah, I would love for you. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 David Baker, reach out to me, and I will certainly reach out. And I and I had to, you know, I had to be convinced. But over the last seven or eight years, I've been, and I, I'm, I'm a Vermonter. I'm not born and raised like Craig is, but You're still I. Still a Vermonter. I, I, yeah. I, but I, all my kids were born here, and you know, we we certainly have done our, our share. But I, I I I had to be convinced. But I I think once they see the numbers and they look at it, yeah. And, and you see those that price for hanging beef? I mean, you, you we'll just can't argue. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, how long do the kids get for meal time? For lunch? Thirty minutes. Yeah, thirty minutes, and, and that's you know that that seems to be okay, you know, and, and we and we had to make that policy because we had some schools that were giving only twenty minutes, some schools were you know, so we've you know we made no less than thirty minutes. Is that K twelve? And that's K twelve. High school. Yes. Actually, yes. Well, exactly, yeah, including the high school. If you give them a chance to eat good food, local yeah. ground food, and give them enough time to enjoy it, Absolutely. they'd probably eat more of it, yeah. and then you wouldn't have any waste. No. Correct. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'll just tell you one success, one, one of my biggest successes yet this year. I've been, only been there since May, and um, I get beat up most every day, but... <laughs> We brought in these local beef patties. We may make the staff patty them by hand, to you know, and we sear them on the grill and blah blah. blah. And one day we have Burger Day once every other week, and one time we had to use up the commodity burgers, and the kids saw them on the line, and our numbers went down by almost thirty-five. Um, because they couldn't smell the burgers cooking, so they knew they weren't the good burgers. So that's that's beautiful right yeah. there. That's what it's all about. That's a good story. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Peter? years. I'm also a Roland Foundation teaching fellow from 2014. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Cameron Hoffman and I'm an eighth grader at Cabot School. Um, I'm Silas Robbins and I'm also an eighth grader at Cabot School. And my name is Eileen Riley and I am a teacher at Cabot School. 
And before we jump in, at the risk of breaking some official rule, we brought bread and cheese that we made bread that we wanted to share with you. Can we pass that around? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the story behind this bread is, you know, that I think for us, part of our motivation around Farm to School is about building community, and that's making food together and breaking bread together. And, and this is artisan bread, it's a Noni recipe that was uh, made, uh, developed by a guy named Jim Leahy and popularized by Mark Bittman, who is uh, very famous author and chef now, and, and if you haven't made no knead bread, you need to, because um, it's super easy and it just uses the gift of time, you know, it rises for 18 to 24 hours, and you cook it in a uh, Dutch oven, and it's delicious, and um, we built this into our curriculum, and, and it's will tell you more about it in a bit, but just about the science of fermentation, and how that works, but you can make something delicious with four basic ingredients, and, and humans have been making and breaking bread for 30,000 years, so we thought we'd share some with you today. So thank you for having us. Yeah. We're really uh, excited to be here and share a little bit of our story with you. Um, at Cabot School, our goal is to design and implement learning experiences in which students investigate, research, build, and present work that intersects with the real world. We are striving to make Farm to School an integral part of that experience. Cabot's Farm to School program helps bring students and community members together, some whose families have been farming for generations and others who have never set foot in a barn or garden. These experiences are providing mirrors and windows for students to see themselves and their potential. Cabot's campus is dotted with garden beds that serve as miniature outdoor classrooms. Students across grade levels plant flowers, herbs, and veggies. Last year's bounty included herbal tea, cucumbers, tomatoes, carrots, beets, kale, beans, pumpkins, watermelons, basil, spinach, and more. Many items are integrated into Cabot's food service program where special projects and students get to directly benefit from their efforts. Pizza from the bread oven with garden veggies may be one of the favorites. <clears throat> Cabot Farm School is helping us develop a positive school culture. Students participate in community events and garden work days where they take an active role in building community. This fosters a sense of belonging for students while offering unique opportunities for personalized learning. The financial award and technical support provided by the Vermont Farm to School has made a marked impact on our ability to enhance our academic programs and school culture. It's enabled us to expand staff and students' knowledge about sustainable agriculture, including how to make nutritious and deli delicious food choices. With the help of our coaches, Cabot's Food Service Program is working to make fresh, local produce meat and dairy more available and developing a procurement model that has open discussions for local regional procurement across our new supervisor union. Participating in Farm to School is also helping us cultivate partnerships with local farmers. We've received technical assistance from organizations including the Vermont Community Gardens Network, Shelburne Farms, and the Center for an Ag Economy. And we're developing a school-wide curriculum that integrates culinary arts, gardens, sustainability, and the sciences and community engagement. Building community is a core goal of Cabot's Farm to School experiences. With that in mind, last fall we held our first annual garden party in which students and members of the community came together for a garden work day called Day in the Dirt. Teams put, together, teams put the gardens to bed for the winter and began preparing new projects for the spring. In the, fir the first and second graders cleaned up the raspberry patch and tended to a few garden projects. Elementary and middle school students created an elderberry garden and cleaned out the veggie beds. Other teams laid the groundwork for a new perennial meditation garden. It was fantastic to see students of all ages working on campus together and enjoying delicious bird cider and donuts. This community event also provided a leadership opportunity for seventh and eighth graders as they were leaders of many small group projects throughout the day. The elementary students gained a deeper understanding of where our food comes from and the importance of a well-balanced diet. It was a nice break from the classroom setting while still being an educational experience. We're using Farm to School to provide new and unique opportunities for personalized learning. For example, preschool students and kindergartners grew herbs to make tea. Elementary classrooms visited local orchards and farms. Middle school students explored sustainable food and built compost bins and furniture for garden spaces and high school students produced a science-focused cookbook. 
This fall, to help us enhance our curriculum and deepen farm school connections, teachers collaborated with educators from Shelburne Farms to facilitate learning experiences that focused on healthy eating, soil science, local agriculture, sustainability, and more. Lessons provide, provided a variety of engaging hands-on activities for students at all levels. Students made applesauce, cheese, pancakes, and butter. And they investigated topics including local food production, pollinators, soil health, and more. Teachers are developing a scope and sequence of lessons and investigations based on these elements. Later this spring, Cabot students will participate in farm-based workshops at Shelburne Farms that investigate ecology, sustainability, nutritious food, and local agriculture. And several classes are integrating farm school themes into extensive project-based learning expeditions. On that, <clears throat> sorry, on that project-based learning note, uh, the middle school's first trimester project-based learning unit this year was entitled Farmed Plate, Redesigning America's Food System. We learned about the ins and outs of America's food system from sugarcane production to the beef industry. We investigated the chemical reactions that occur when making artisan bread, learned about photosynthesis, and analyzed excerpts from Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma. After we learned all this, we each designed an expert project, a specific topic to focus on for the remainder of the trimester. Exhibits included a podcast about factory farming, a cookbook made with Vermont Harvest of the Month recipes, a climate zone map showing where food comes from and its impact on the environment, along with much more. For my expert project, I chose to create a TED-style talk exploring the, it the, the issues with the current fast food system and how we can solve them. This project as a whole helped our students learn about the benefits of nutritious local foods impacting our health and our community. Let me pause it for one second. We brought a few artifacts to share with you from our current uh, our first semester project. We'd love for you to pass around as you listen to the testimony. Cabot Farm to School is about much more than nutrition, curriculum, and gardens. It's about building a community and learning and growing together. On November 2nd, Cabot, school, Cabot Farm to School hosted a community harvest supper. Cabot chef Brock Miller and, K and students K-8 worked together to prepare a delicious meal that included smoked local pork from Snug Valley Farm, chickens from Sox Family Farm, veggies from Bullshed Farm, Cabot Smith Farm, Dance and Carrot Farm, Carpenter Pitkin Farm, Sunny Meadow Farm, Tempe from Rapsi, as well as apples and ciders from Bird's Orchard. Over 200 community members enjoyed a delicious meal and musical entertainment from Cabot School musicians and singers. We hope to make the event an, an annual tradition. During this project, we studied the process of making artisan bread to give us some background knowledge for our project on sustainability. We learned about bread science, fermentation, and how the yeast consumes the sugar, releasing CO2, which makes the bread rise. We learned why it's more sustainable to make your own bread instead of buying the 50 plus ingredient loaves of bread in supermarkets. Our class made 30 loaves of bread for the Harvest Supper, which not only supported the community, but also allowed our class to have a hands-on activity that connected to our projects. Another way the Farm to School program has been integrated into student life is through our innovative middle school jobs program, Cabot Leads. Cabot Leads is a leadership program that empowers students' voice cultivates new skills and provides authentic opportunities for personalized learning and taking an active role in the community. All fifth through eighth grade students apply for three posted jobs with a cover letter and an interview for those jobs. Positions range from working in the library to being a tech assistant, but there are a number of jobs each year that are part of our farm school program. We have students working in the kitchen every day as well as assisting with special meals. Students planting and maintaining the gardens, starting seeds, and farm apprentices working at several local farms. Silas worked on the culinary team as a sixth grader, and this year he is part of the gardening grounds team. Last year he apprenticed at Molly Brook Farm, a ninth generation organic dairy with about 70 milking jerseys and an international reputation for breeding stock. Silas and his team each followed a young calf from tagging to weaning to moving to the heifer barn. This year's team has met with the farm's veterinarian to learn about the milk cycle and reproduction. Every visit there are new opportunities to learn about animal health, the economics of managing a small farm, and the history of agriculture in, in Cabot. 
students clean calf pens, do other small tasks around the farm, and get their questions answered. We have some really interesting questions. <laughs> this has been a life-changing experience for our farm teams. We have a number of relationships with local farms whose children and grandchildren attend Cabot School, and we are building more connections with greenhouse growers and other producers as part of our Farm to School program. Our farmers are keenly interested in passing on their knowledge to the next generation, and they enthusiastically give of their time every week to share their love of farming. As Jen Churchill of Wonder Why Farm has said to me on more than one occasion, Kids need to know where their food comes from and how it is being produced in their own community. Brock Miller, our chef and food service director, is a core member of our Farm to School team at Cabot, and although he was unable to be with you here today, he is deeply committed to healthy food, sustainability, and farm partnerships. He has revolutionized our lunch and snack offerings participation in and enthusiasm for food served at Cabot is at an all-time high. Good food is a centerpiece of our community events and celebrations. Brock offers this assessment of the farm to school program. And this is, this is his um, testi testimony that I'm gonna read here. Thus far, our harvest supper has been the most impactful portion of our farm to school experience. It was a way to involve nearly all the students in the school, many local farmers, and a significant amount of the community in a one-night event that truly brought us together as a large family. The Farm to School program funds spent on this meal enabled us to collect donations for future harvest suppers with the goal of making the event annual for many years beyond the grant. Students took ownership of their roles and still speak about this event as a time that they learned many things and felt like a part of the larger community. Without Farm to School, this would not have been possible. Farm to School technical assistance has helped us build a stronger, wider network with the many small producers in our region. And this brings significant benefits to the local ag economy. Although we are a small school, we are surrounded by relatively small producers. Cabot School is potentially the largest customer for some of them and a major source of income for others. Technical assistance has also made local purchasing accessible by creating bid templates that are user-friendly for the purchaser as well as for the farmer producer. This is essential as procurement rules from USDA are very specific and confusing at times. These templates make the process less tedious for food service staff and farmers alike who might otherwise choose not to participate if the process is too difficult and time consuming to do so. As a provision to uh, universal meal school food program with a high participation rate and a large amount of full pay students participating, the increase in reimbursement that is being proposed would have a tremendous effect on our ability to purchase locally and increase the quality of the ingredients we use. I feel that universal meals are extremely important. Our community lives well below the poverty line on average, and the school food program provides many of our students with their highest quality and consistent meals each week. Students receiving these meals, regardless of their family's ability to pay, is important on many levels. Erasing any stigmas of eating a lesser quality lunch, ensuring that all students are well nourished and able to concentrate and learn, and exposing students to food they may otherwise never get to try are just a few ways that universal meals are of the utmost importance. We are grateful for, for the financial support, coaching, and technical assistance that comes with being a Pharma School grant recipient. This work is having a significant positive impact on Cabot students and the broader community. Thank you for investing in Vermont's farm economy and the Farm to School program. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share some of our story with you here today. Well, thanks and thank you very much. You're truly the middle of the That's why we brought them. Ah, yes, sir. So I, I have two questions. One is, how do you manage 
fact that the growing season and our school year are, don't line up that conveniently. I mean, the harvest happens after the school year has begun, but there are so many, you know, are, is that something that you manage to get a lot of the kids into summer program or how, or do you put it into storage? Yeah, I'll take a stab at the beginning of it. Is one is mm -hmm. the first thing to, to be really clear about is we're not trying to grow 100% of the food we eat on campus. Yeah. We're, we have this philosophy of sort of a, like a kind of like a edible gardens where students can drift by and grab a carrot or a tomato and and we do with that said we we have provided the the food service program with a bounty of fresh produce during the fall um, specifically to your question um, there is a summer meals program that, for the district and our food service director has used some of that produce for twinfield and cabinet summer program and then we we're getting smarter about how we organize the planting and so we're trying to plant as late as possible and, and sometimes plant maybe, you know, a second crop of something later. And so we're getting smarter about it. This is sort of our, it's our third year mm -hmm. of education around it. And we, we're really looking to grow the program. The other thing that's worth mentioning is in the winter months, obviously we're not growing anything. Um, and our, our kind of long-term goal is we'd like to, to build a greenhouse slash outdoor classroom that we heat with residual heat from our wood chip plant. Um, there's a plenty of excess heat for that, and our hope is that we can grow enough greens to support the salad bar um, school year round. And the, the second part of my question is, the curriculum descriptions are so amazing, and I'm wondering, and, and this may not be a question for you, um, but how much of that is shared so that it can be used to prompt other schools to take up some of these really exciting um, topics and processes? Well, I mean, we're, we're very open to sharing. I think we're fortunate that we're, we're connected with other uh, schools and organizations that are doing a lot of this great work, and Farm School is one, one of those networks. And I think um, this has been, it's been a process, right? I, and I've been at Cabot 16 years, and I've been able to help shepherd that process in my time here. And fortunately, you have um, motivated teachers who are willing to go down that path, and then motivated students who recognize the benefits of being able to be more self-directed in, in the driver's seat of their experiences. And our model of project-based learning gives students the opportunity to design their own projects based on some aspect or some interest of their own, right? And so some of the descriptions you may see in front of you, those are, those are what students design um, in, in, in their own writing, their own projects. And so, you know, Cameron was talking about delivering a TED Talk. She literally stood up and delivered a TED Talk in, in, as an eighth grader, and that may seem it may have seemed like, oh, she just did it in front of a camera and played it or whatever. And no, this is a room full of people, and an eighth grade student stood up and delivered a compelling TED Talk in that style, and that was her artifact, and that's a public exhibition of learning. And so that, to me, is fuel, and that really blows me away, and what, it's what keeps me teaching. The, uh, um, to qualify for your universal meals program, did you have to do any outreach in your community to get people to fill out the paperwork properly so you could qualify, or did it just come? Yeah, and I think just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not equipped to answer that question specifically, although I do know in regards to the paperwork, that was a barrier. And this is our third year as Universal Meals, you know? So um, our food service director would have a longer, more involved answer for you, but I think the paperwork part was problematic. And then they, they, I think, got smarter about how they sent out that paperwork and what channels they used to make sure it came back. We had, we, I mean, that's the greatest program going. And uh, we had some schools that lost out on the Universal Meals program uh, this particular year. So it's uh, too bad. And I, I got to say, we're, we're very fortunate because I think this program works because of the people involved in it. And I think a lot of times people look at grant money and they're like, oh, $15,000 in technical assistance. And they, they get it and they do something for a year or two and it, it, it can wither. Teachers leave, food service directors leave. And from the first day we thought about applying for this grant, we thought about how are we going to make it sustainable. That was our, our fundamental goal. So when, when I leave and, and when me leaves and when these guys graduate or when Brock leaves, that the person stepping in steps into a structure that is ready to go for them. So we need to make our mission and vision really reflective of what this looks like. We need to make the food service job description like, oh, farm school is a part of that. And, and that doesn't exist yet, but that's sort of our, our next 
stage of develop development. What we are doing now on the ground is looking at this curriculum ladder and how do we build curricula where when a new teacher comes in, here, here are some samples of farm school lessons that you can teach. Here is your garden bed that you can plant. And so there's no, there aren't those barriers for folks. Rose? Um, so thank you all, and I would love to hear your TED talk. You have we recorded it, <laughs> yes. a video of it, but you sent it. It's excellent, along. yeah. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's really great to see you both so involved in this as students. Um, so thank you for all of that. I'm sure you're inspiring other kids to get involved in it at your school. Um, I'm wondering if you, uh, so I'm sorry, I don't remember your position. Are a you, middle school you, teacher. You're a teacher. Mm -hmm. So you may not know this information. I'm wondering if you have any idea of what percentage of local foods your food service program purchases. I don't know, okay. but I can, I can get the information for you. Um, I, I know. Pierce and I are, as you know, the bill that we're working mm -hmm. on for local foods, we're just trying to get a sense of where schools are at, and then also the uh, similar to what Senator Starr just asked about the, the paperwork mm -hmm. and how big of a barrier would the paperwork be for getting the local foods incentive. But it sounds like you I don't know the number, but what I can say specifically is that um, with the assistance of you know, Abby was phenomenal, and she came in and worked with Brock to sort of clear the path. And I think without without that structure, it would not have happened. And Brock, Brock, and she helped him set up a system yep. to track. So the system school. has already been set up in your school. It yeah. has been. Yeah. yeah, but he said that we wouldn't see this sort of ripple effect until next year, because when when we were doing this, we we're past the point of purchasing. And one of our one of our obstacles, and I'm I don't think we're alone in this, is storage. And so you want to be able to buy as much of whatever it is and store it. You know, if it's something that can be stored, obviously. But that's something that we have to contend with. And, and you know, we're going to use farm to school funds to purchase an, another cooler. 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 So that's part of our strategy: is how do we look at purchasing and look at storage as well. John, uh, two of the uh, stars uh, of the agency of agricultural food markets are graduates of your school, and so I was wondering if you've been able to share your achievements or hands and tethers or Dr. Well, Anson was there when we received the award, and, and he is, he is I think, somewhat aware of what's going on at Cabot. Um, but we are really grateful to be in this community, and I think um, we have, philosophically, we try and use not just the school building as our classroom, but looking at the community as a way to, to foster learning opportunities for all our students. And we use our K-12 structure as more of an advantage than a detriment. And I think it can be challenging to try and meet kids at all those different levels in this day and age. But the reality is if we can build programs that, that have cross-age teaching and learning opportunities or programs where kids are looking, look, working the garden together, um, breaking bread together, so to speak, that, that's a, a real example of a community, not isolating certain age levels of students in, in one spot. Uh, to be together. So it's really, it's worked for us, but it's been a labor of love and, and we're very deliberate about it. Uh, yeah, now your bread's delicious. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> you need to try and make it. Yeah. yeah. And when I was eating that, I got to thinking, you know, you got a couple of good candidates right here to participate in the Iron Chef program. It's funny you should mention that, because I think that's one of our goals for next year, is yeah. to get a team in the, uh, well, in the yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think Brock has been a judge yep. for that. He's he's worked with that group. I'm one of the judges this year. All right. Yeah. Too bad you're not. Oh, this year. <laughs> uh, one thing about the bread, oh, oh, oh. The, the bread, the flour for this bread came from a, a, you know Champlain Mills, and it's uh, you know, we're trying to purchase local flour when we make these breads. And um, when we did the bread for the Harvest Supper, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah. So we like accumulated a bunch of different flowers. I think it was like four different flowers um, and made four different types of bread that people could choose from. Um, and I actually made uh, little information cards about each of the individual flowers and their different health benefits, um, where they came from, um, and the differences between them. We all use, we used all ancient green flowers um, and we researched the importance of ancient grains uh, in our diets in comparison to the like refined grains which have all their or some of their nutrients stripped away and then sometimes enriched and added back but um, we really we did uh, a deep dive into the science of bread um, and the importance of ancient grains and grains in our diets I think I heard you say that 
uh, students had to apply, like, because they, they were looking for a job, which I think is such a, none of our colleagues would think of that as a benefit of farm to school, I think. But it's a wonderful cross-pollination uh, of what you're all doing. One of the hurdles that, one of the questions that's come up around uh, this incentive idea is how do you account for food that's actually been grown on the ground? So if, if say, if we're aiming for 25% of, of food to be local, but you don't pay anything for the produce out of your garden, we need to figure out how to account for that. And I'm wondering, it seems like that would be a good student, you know, math project for the, for- Could be a job class, right? Okay, so yeah. that's, that's not crazy. Mm -hmm. that we no, that's that not crazy at all. Okay. That's good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess you passed. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the students from Berlin are here and they're wondering if they might be able to yeah. change the order and go next. Well, we'd have to take a vote on that. <laughs> no, but, um, if you'd like to come up, that's fine. station at the school picnic and junior show and a math and science skills with the mystery box program. Wow, I assume you're as surprised as I was to learn about all of these options. I just started attending Rowan's school last year. 
I came from another Vermont school and they did not, did not have all of these amazing activities. Please support from the school so that more students have access to hands-on learning opportunities focused on, lo on our local farms, food, recycling, and composting. Thank you. Hi, my name is Teddy and I'm in fifth grade. My family has a homestead farm with vegetables, fruit, chickens, and bees, so I'm used to having fresh food around. However, Farm to School at Berlin has helped me realize that not all students know how to garden. However, since Berlin has a huge garden with 17 raised beds, every classroom, pre-K to 6, takes care of their own bed. It is so cool seeing kids surprise to dig up potatoes and onions. We also have a shed to store all of our garden tools, an apple orchard, and other perennial fruit bushes. Every student plants seeds, waters, weeds, and harvests food to share with the community and cook in our classrooms. We also maintain the garden walkways as spreading wood chairs. It is wild to see all the kids with forks, shovels, and wheelbarrows. We're all like worker bees. Hi, my name is Sophia, and I'm in sixth grade. Every year in September, our school does an open house where each classroom makes a different finger food snack to share with our families from our garden. We've made homemade ketchup with our tomatoes served with roasted potato wedges, pesto using our basil and garlic, roasted green beans, and pear and apple bread from our orchard, which was planted two years ago. I will always remember what happened during one of these farm to school events. A local TV was filming and I offered to show them an edible perennial in our garden. It's called sorrel and it's really sour. It was funny watching his face, uh, watching the cameraman's face after he tried it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jake. I'm in sixth grade. Each classroom has a bin of reusables, bowls, cups, and silverware from a jump from a grant funded by Central Vermont Solid Waste, School Zero Waste Grant. When we have classroom celebrations or cooking, we use real cups, bowls, and silverware instead of single-use plastic and paper. We are learning to keep unnecessary trash out of the landfill and taking responsibility by washing our own dishes. Each classroom even has a drying rack. My name is John, and I am in sixth grade. Another nice farm to school activity at our school is the mystery box program. All students in third and fourth grade participate in a weekly mystery box lesson. Allison Levin from Community Harvest of Central Vermont brings a box with a mystery vegetable. By asking questions, we have to figure out what the vegetable is and then do a math and science activity. We measure, weigh, draw, compare, research the vegetable's origins, and finally, eat it. It is a nice way to learn about how different vegetables look and taste when they are raw. We learn about vegetables we might not be familiar with, like celeriac, kohlrabi, fennel, and brown cherries. Hi, I'm back. Since our friend's fin is sick today, snack program. At Royan, this is how it works. Every day, a different fresh fruit or vegetable is delivered to each classroom. Everyone gets to try food, foods they may not necessarily ne necessary, have ever eaten, like kale chips and roasted asparagus. We all heard kids say gross when they see new foods, but many times when they try it, they like it. I was surprised to like parsnips. My teacher told me that this program was funded by the Agency of Education Child Nutrition Grant. We all think it's really worthwhile having opportunities like the Healthy Snack Program so kids can try new, fresh, local food. Not for you on TV. <laughs> My name is Gavin. I'm in fifth grade. 
Currently, Berlin has three different composting options. Off-site composting, one composting, and a three-bin composter. In 2018, a three-bin composter was built in the garden with the help of high school students from Central Vermont Korea Center. I, I have been a main student for other students how to use this compost. Each week, we, ha we weigh one bucket of cafeteria waste. We let outside, mix it with these, and take the temperature. Last year was the first year we were able to use our own free compost to fertilize our garden. I love doing this because we have to use our muscles and muscles. Hi, my name is JJ, and I'm a sixth grader. Gavin just told you about three ways our school already composts, so you might think it's crazy that we need another way to deal with our classroom food waste to address, to address Act 148, but we do. This fall, I was one of the seven sixth graders here who wrote and were awarded the Central Vermont Solid Waste School Zero Waste Grant for a tumbler composter. It will deal with all classroom snack waste. We tried to use other systems, but for many reasons, they didn't work. The cool thing about this tumbler is that the sixth graders will be able to take care of all classroom food scraps by ourselves because the tumbler will be located outside in clear view of the office. We will also be able to use the compost we make to fertilize our garden for free, unlike the cafeteria food scraps that are taken off site. Hey, my name is Lucas. I'm a sixth grade. I'll explain how this tumbler will deal with our classroom food scraps. After snack time, kids put their food scraps in a small little bucket here. At the end of every school day, teams of sixth graders will collect all the buckets and then dump the food scraps into the tumbler. We will add wood chips, turn the tumbler, rinse out buckets, and return buckets to the classroom. Uh, we will make up to 10 cubic feet of compost for our school garden beds all by ourselves. At the end of each school year, the sixth graders will train the fifth graders how to do the job. So this process will continue year after year as a sixth grade community service. Thank you for supporting Farm to School projects. As you can see, we have learned so much about ways to make our lives healthier since we are a Farm to School, well, school. <laughs> Now, we got some questions for the panel. <laughs> yes. So, one of you, I think maybe it was Sophie, um, mentioned that you have an orchard. Do you have, a, you have a school orchard? Did you all plant the trees? And how does the orchard work? Um, oh, yeah. Um, we, so you, as um, Teddy said, we have a garden. And there are blueberry, raspberry, and such bushes planted all around, along with trees. We have a plum tree, apple tree, pear tree, and many more plants. And um, so we just wait. <laughs> <laughs> So we worked with the Dairy Rotary, um, and they helped us with, with financing of it. We also worked with Dave Wilcox, who is the state forester who did that planting. And the students from, um, from the Dairy Career Center came and helped also. So it's been a, a very community-oriented project. And the trees are, I think this is their third winter, so. Uh -huh. We were getting a few apples last fall, but mostly the ones around the garden have been there longer. Uh -huh. um, and those are very more. These will come along. Do you have pe people who come and help take care of the trees, pruning and all that kind of yes, thing? Yes, yeah, Dave Wilcox and the very clear 
um, sent her students with Amanda Garland. I don't know if you know her, but yeah. she's quite involved. Excellent. That's a bit. And do you uh, have universal meals uh, at your school, or do you, that's, universal meals is where you don't have to pay for your lunch. No, we don't have that. You have to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not so great. <laughs> it sounds Especially like Especially if you have no coins in your pocket. Uh, uh, but how many, how many children do you have in your school? Uh, we have about 200. Yeah. A little bit more. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, other questions for the children from Berlin? Well, thank you very much. You did a great job. Very proud of all of you. Thank you for coming. Good job. Are you staying? How long are you guys staying here? Two o'clock, I think. Two o'clock. <laughs> Farm, now called West Farm. 
in uh, 2012, uh, same year my son was born. That was not advisable. Uh, starting a farm and a family at the same time. Uh, well, we survived it. I'd say that's probably a good way to put it. Um, we started out at about a three quarters of an acre. Um, and we do pretty much all wholesale. We are about seven to 10 acres of vegetable production right now. Still pretty much all wholesale. Um, three years ago, I, uh, 2017 was the first year I started getting into selling to institutions and schools. And uh, it wasn't necessarily my idea, um, but I'm very glad that we did it. Uh, Farming is hard. Wholesale farming in commodities is even harder, and institutional sales are just about the hardest. Uh, so it's been a challenge. Um, I think all of us recognize pieces of that challenge. We're all part of that challenge. We're all negotiating it. Sometimes it feels like, um, as I said to somebody earlier today, we are trying to dump out a puzzle and have all the pieces fall together at the same time. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I uh, started selling to schools and hospitals. I sell to about, I think, about 12 schools in my county and another county. Uh, I sell to two hospitals, um, Copley and, and uh, Northwestern Medical. Um, and it's all very, very small proportions. Um, but that's what, you know, it, it is a, definitely a work in progress. Um, so I want to kind of pause that narrative and just kind of relay the story of going to visit a friend a few years ago. Um, the wife is very much in passionate about dairy farming and has a micro dairy. Her husband is, she's a first generation farmer, he's a multi generation farmer. And he doesn't really farm. He lets her do the farming, most of it. Uh, and I was talking to him, and uh, he he, he kind of, out of the blue, he said to me, and I'm going to withhold the profanity, but he said, I am so sick of farming. And uh, there was a real, real bitterness there. And it's not, I think, an uncommon bitterness for people who have been in the business of farming for so long. Um, because the business of farming is a bitter, bitter thing sometimes. Uh, but it left me shocked because I've, since I've got into this business, I've been super passionate about it. I find a lot of joy in it. I find a lot of meaning in it. So I, it was kind of, it was kind of something I couldn't reconcile. Uh, this past year was really challenging. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think it's just for me more than anything. You know, I could say economics, I could say weather, I could blame it on any number of things. I think it's for me just a, a mental and you know maybe a deeper process of kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And working harder and harder every year and feeling like success is sorry, I'm gonna drive up farther and farther away. Um, and I hit that point this fall where, yeah, farming really sucks. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty dark. Um, you know, I think I had to sit with that. And thankfully, we have seasons in the state where one can sit with things and reflect on them. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, you know, this isn't a logical problem. It's the meaning I found in my work uh, vanished overnight. And uh, you can't farm without some sort of meaning. I think some people do it for the money and <laughs> they're successful at it. But most people aren't farming or working on the land or working with children for money. Sorry, 
I'm a little bit of an emotional person. Um, so, yeah, I sat with that, reflecting on it. I'm working through it. And I think I had to come to terms with two things, really kind of reflect on these things. And the one first is I had to let go of making a difference. Because making a difference suggests that I know what change is, what's good, what the right vision is, that it's quantifiable. I don't know. I don't have any sort of insight into that. I have intuitions. I think that, like I said, we share the same vision um, at our core. I think we have a hard time reconciling ourselves to our different expressions of that shared vision. When we get there, I don't know. But it was, it's, it's been pretty freeing to me to realize that it's not up to me to make a difference. It's not that I give up or that I'm not motivated to have a positive impact, but I don't have to do that counting of what is my difference and what does it mean. And the second thing, the second part of it is the, the what and the how of what I am in service to. The what is, I'm, is it, is it the land? Is it the kids? Is it my family? Is it the sick people? Uh, is it my employees? Is it my business partners? Is it my creditors? What am I in service to? And the obvious answer to that is all of them. And that is what we call community. Um, and then the how is the part I'm still learning. And the how is by building relationships. And I'm starting to value that a lot more than I did. I'm pretty slow and stubborn at these things. Uh, when I go to do a taste test at my son's school, he gets very excited. He's, he's really excited to do that. And uh, I'm starting to get more excited to do that stuff. But, you know, he gets it. He gets it. He wants to take the food, which is a gift from the land, and give that food to his friends and his teachers. He, he knows this intuitively. And I'm the dum-dum who's just figuring it out. <laughs> um, and that's really what I think the core value of local food and what this is all about. We can talk about nutrition, we can talk about economics, uh, we, can, we can talk about all sorts of things. But the core, at the core of it, I think, is, is this relational aspect of food that has been missing and it's been degrading. It's been degrading as our communities are degrading because without that relation, there's no meaning. So I can't quantify what it means or what difference it makes um, when I go to a school and get kids to try sauerkraut and beets. It might not make any difference at all. Um, but it does establish a relationship between me and them and their food um, and their access to the land or to the, the relationship to the land and to their community. Um, and right now, I think that's what's really important. Uh, I think I've kind of said what I needed to say. Oh. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, thank you, uh, Angus. Um, are there questions for, for Angus? I think, I think you should be commended for doing all this work and supplying food to uh, hospitals, schools. Uh, you know, it, um, sometimes you don't feel like you're rewarded. <clears throat> but watching those little kids run around, watching sick people get better, uh, you know, those are some of the rewards that, that you don't really get directly, but indirectly. You know, and, and, uh, so thanks a lot for all you do uh, to you know spread the good word and, and make sure people are fed. Uh, 
healthy uh, homes. Yeah, I um, appreciate that. Sure. Um, but I guess probably along the same lines of what uh, Senator Starr just said, I. I think it would be a mistake to assume that you don't make a difference every day. They're just differences we can't measure. Yes, I, I think that's the quantitative aspect of it, the value-driven analysis, I don't think makes sense. And I don't n need there to be a quantitative reward or any sort of reward. I think it's just intrinsic from understanding what my value system is, uh, I, I, the reward is the process. The reward is whether the school buys one bag of carrots or 20 bags of carrots. It's just being there. Not to say that there's not a lot of work to do. There's not a lot of more that can be done. Um, but I also think it's a shame um, to be coming back here every year and having the same conversation. Um, because it says to me that our, our values aren't in alignment, because this should be unquestioned. I, I want to echo the thank you, and I'm, I particularly appreciate the image of the puzzle. Uh, don't, what did you say? Don't make the puzzle out. And I'm hoping that it all fits together perfectly. And I would just offer, I think I'm going to play with your analogy a little bit, because we don't get to dump it onto a table. The commodity system has us dumping it onto better tables. And so we're hoping, you know, it's even more unrealistic. And we all live in that system too, because the state government can't overcome that on its own. And, and I just offer that as, as uh, cause it's a powerful image that you've offered me, that this is, talk about community, where we are trying to wrestle through this system that is, unquestionably broken at a national level, I would argue, especially internationally. Um, but I also take great hope from from works like farms like you're doing and, and the kids that are coming up and not just here today, but telling us all over the state that this is meaningful to them. And, um, you know, last year we heard from folks, kids who had uh, severe learning disabilities and, and different kinds of um, characteristics that made them not a good fit in the classroom. And, and they were not sort of brought to life in a sense until they started working on a farm every day. And, and, and to have these kids come and tell us stories where, where their teacher would say, you know, they never used to speak at all, things like that. There, there are little elements of it. And I think for all of us, we're trying to rope those together and build something. So you're really uh, part of that, and, and you know, it's not much, but thank you. <laughs> my, my, I can't offer much is what I need, uh, but, but thank you. Thank you, and um, I guess I would, I would kind of echo that back to you, and that I agree that it's not up to the state to fix the problem. The state is not all powerful. <coughs> Nobody is all powerful to solve this problem. This is, this is, this sort of. Rebuilding of community and healing, it's up to all of us. And, um, you know, I, I hope the state can do as much as they can to nourish that wherever it's expect, expressed. Yeah. Uh, can I just answer something at the risk of also getting emotional? Um, years ago, um, Pete Seeger, uh, who I think most people know, came to my house, he was doing a, a, a benefit for um, the Progressive Alliance in Brattleboro, which I was a member of. And uh, he stayed at our house. And uh, one, one of the days I was uh, doing dishes, he was sitting on my grandmother's stool. And I said, Pete, how do you keep it up? You know, how, how can you keep up this work? Um, and he said, well, Carolyn, uh, it's really sometimes very hard. Um, his, one of his major projects was cleaning up the Hudson River and the clear water. Uh, and he said, but this is what I liken it to. And uh, in my head, I imagine a, a, a seesaw. And at one end, there are some really massive rocks. And at the other end, there's a basket 
would stand. And there are people like you and people like me who go by the basket of sand and you pour a spoonful on. And it leaks out of the basket and it begins to tip, but then it, you know, but he said, if we just keep putting the sand in there, we're going to. Beautiful yeah. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you very much and good luck for you. All right, thank you for your time. Thanks, Andrews. That's uh, Melon. Oh, I think we're going to come up together. You're going to tag team? Yeah. Good. The power numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Beth and Mary. Yes, yeah. Beth and Mary. Sure, I'll go first. Good morning, my name is Mary Feldman, and um, I'm the Executive Director of the Parent Child Center of Rutland County, which is one of 15 of the Parent Child Centers in Vermont. Um, we're an organization that's currently in our second year of the Farm to School Grant, an early childhood education grant. Um, and the perspective that I want to offer you is what the grant looks like on the ground, more so from the eyes of the children, um, but the other side of the eyes of the children. First of all, I want to thank you for the grant because the grant makes a difference. The parent-child centers operate at a 30% structural deficit. So to do very important things like break the food to pharma pipeline, we need the funding that you provide and we're deeply grateful for it. Uh, during the past two years, the staff of the parent-child center Rutland County noticed that many of the families and children we serve were experiencing food insecurity. Um, health and wellness, it, took the form of ramen noodles, three-year-olds coming to school, to our, we call our program a school, to our ECE program with a packet of cookies um, and very calorie-rich foods. And so one of the things that was really important to me as an executive director was to cancel what I call the tin can culture of the feeding program at the Early Childhood Education Center. So we want to move away from those giant cans and get connected to our local community and the food that was found there. Um, it's very difficult to see children who are three experiencing food insecurity. Um, and that was offensive to me as a human being that other human beings should have to live like that. So these low income and working families, as well as their young children, did not have access to healthy foods. They were unable to afford consistent meals and they experienced the stress of worrying about providing food for their families. It became too clear to us as an agency that we needed to serve families who did not qualify for assistance, but were still struggling to make ends meet. We call them the working poor. Um, we look at food at our agency as health, and I really appreciate what Mr. Baldwin said, that food is a gift from the land. That resonated with me. The PCC understands that nutritious food is important to brain development in children and that nutritional deficiencies contribute to a plethora of problems, including learning among infants. The greatest uh, amount of brain development happens with babies um, and toddlers. There are emotional problems, language development, and the overall general health of children who have food insecurity. The Parent Child Center believes that all children and families have the right to food and that poverty in childhood should not ex express itself through um, an individual's life well into adulthood. And that's what happens with food insecurity. So we decided to do something about that um, by making a commitment to tackling food insecurity in Rutland County and building a vision plan around this throughout our entire agency. And I keep looking at Beth because she was very instrumental in making that happen for our community. The Farm to School Grant has been critical and allowing us to do this in our early childhood education program. The vision plan that we developed included weaving the importance of food security and nutrition throughout all of our programs, especially our early childhood education center, and alongside the parents, which is something we don't talk about when we think about the farm to school. It really gets home. It's farm to school to home. We believe in a whole family approach at the parent child center and that to incur long-term change, the parents were a vital part of the process. We establish a food pantry where parents can utilize a take what you need policy, and the pantry is stocked with fresh produce, dairy, and shelf stable items. But the things that the parents were taking home were things that the Farm to School Grant allowed the children to come into contact with in their school setting. 
We have built into our parenting uh, groups a healthy community meal and the opportunity to help prepare it. We have created cooking classes to introduce cooking with fresh local fruits and vegetables and have begun to in better integrate fresh local foods into our early childhood education programs through our Farm to School Grant. Healthy children today is a healthy workforce in 20 years. And so that's really important. That's also a way of stabilizing our economy and our workforce. Our goal with our Farm to School Grant is not just to feed one child at a time. The Farm to School Grant, although committed to our children, can be seen woven throughout all of our programs. We want to educate children and their families. Our food system provides a full array of experiential learning for our little friends, from the biology of plants and chemistry of soils to food harvesting, storage, preparation, cooking. I grew up in the projects of Philadelphia, and I really did not understand that chickens and eggs went together. Like, you know? <laughs> so it's very important that our children, especially as Vermonters, Which that they- Which one came first? <laughs> <laughs> Still working on that. The funding came first. <laughs> fed her for a day, teach a kid to plant, grow, harvest, prepare, and cook food, and you fed her for life. Our parents have the same opportunity to learn about food in our parenting classes. Our ECE programs have family nights regularly, and food, food, um, food is love, you know, from where I come from. So we, we share that with uh, the parents and children at our family nights. Um, pretty soon. So making sure we have all the food is a very basic step, but we're going beyond that. We educate, grow, and we come together in community over our meal, seeing food as an act of local culture and a commitment to a healthy life. Um, we are working with local farmers, producers to stock the shelves of our pantry and, and flesh out the menus for our programs. The conscious linkage of our food system with our wider, wider ecological and cultural landscape gives us a larger and deeper sense of home and the security and confidence that comes with that. We're proud of the positive outcomes of our food program uh, that, that it's having on our local community. These outcomes could only have been achieved with the Farm to School Grant because we live in uh, an ethical relationship with grants that we receive, so although we don't have money for a lot of what we do, this grant enabled us to focus on the food. Coming to the Parent Child Center of Rutland is entering a caring community where many needs can be addressed. The Farm to School Grant provides the Parent Child Center staff with the technical assistance that was needed as well as the funds to achieve our goals. Our children come to the Early Childhood Education Program Center to eat fresh produce, learn about food, learn where it comes from, learn about the health, the impact of food, and little, little, our little friends, our youngest members of our community, learn to discriminate lifelong habits around eating. Um, and healthy habits of eating and that their relationship to the, the local community. We believe quality food for all is one of the best investments we can make because of the Farm to School Grant, and we can achieve this goal. Uh, Michael Pollan, which our, uh, the students quoted earlier today, says the shared meal elevates eating from the mechanical process of fueling the body to a ritual of family and community, from the mere animal biology to an act of culture. And you know what's coming next. In order to continue this good work, we, we are requesting $500,000 annually in the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program. And we please uh, ask you to make sure that, that the base of $231,000 does not decrease. Additionally, please support the local purchasing incentive bill to increase the amount of local food served in school nutrition programs and to support Vermont farms and our local economy and to develop our, uh, a healthy workforce in 20 years. These two bills work together to support access to healthy local food for all Vermont children. Would you like, are you up next? Or you I am, we're, we're sort of up together from the same organization, so um, yeah, I mean, sir, sir, certainly I can go next. You can ask Mary questions and then I can go. Well, if you're from the same crew, we are. we'll go for it and then we'll ask you questions. Great, great, great. And I'll try not to be redundant here. Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Beth Miller, and I'm the Community Impact Director for the Parent Child Center of Rutland County. We have two sites, one in Brandon and one in Rutland. Um, we are, as Mary said, in our second year of the, uh, the Farm to School program. So our top priority at the PCC is to help individuals and families um, in our community who are struggling with poverty. Um, that includes the working poor, as Mary had suggested. 
The majority of the uh, children and families enrolled in our programs do struggle with the barriers that keep them, them in poverty. And we believe that one of the best ways to challenge these barriers is to provide the children and families with knowledge of and access to healthy food. And Farm to School has allowed us that. For the PCC, Farm to School addresses the trajectory of poverty, starting with the child. And for us, that is infant through five, through five years, as he or she begins to understand their world. Farm to School and ECE brings nutrition directly into the young children's arena. They're introduced to healthy eating, sustainable agriculture, and the local community culture. They are taught about the foods they eat, brought by local farmers. The children bring these ideas and activities home to their parents. The PCC then augments the children's enthusiasm and knowledge by access to healthy food available at our food shelf. The shared healthy meals created at home then reinforces the learning from the classroom and cafeteria. Everybody wins. Farm to School has also allowed us to build deeper relationships with the farmers in Rutland County who keep our lands working at our bellies full of nutritional produce. And this is, oh, you're here. I wanted to say <laughs> that when the farmers show up at the ECE program with their food in hand, like the joy is palpable. Like it makes such a difference that your, your connection to your food, the care that you bring to that food, is delivered to the children like directly. They get it. <laughs> okay. Um, so these local farmers have showed up for the children with produce in hand, knowledge and resources, all to support our Farm to School program. We're really excited to learn that the local, pur uh, the local purchasing initiative, um, this will allow us to increase the amount of local fresh food that we can give to these children. Through the Farm to School network, we're creating a community garden that's 10,000 square feet at our early childhood, our early childhood site in Rutland. And we have another site in uh, Brandon that's a little smaller. And this is where children, parents, and PCC staff and community members work together to provide, <laughs> ner nervous, to provide nutritional food. This garden will support the good work being done in the cafeteria and the classroom, and will also support the relationships we've built in the community. I really want to thank the um, farm school staff, who uh, Cynthia is in the back there. She has been our coach, and she has really provided us with a, a, a really secure, um, inclusive direction. So by inclusive, I mean like helping us to gather the community members, including the farmers, um, that will really create create a sustainable uh, farm to school program. So we uh, are going with great optimism and uh, security into our uh, into our community garden. So oh, let me add one more thing. Um, I want to thank the. Uh, the Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program, which I know is also up for um, consideration uh, for funding, that too really helps to um, keep the farm to school going. Like that is feeding directly into our ability to work with rural farmers and with fresh <coughs> produce in our ECE programs. So, are there questions from any of the committee members? Uh, are, are, I'm, I'm assuming the answer to this is yes, but just to be sure, you're a food service authority, a school food service authority, is that correct? Do you get funding through the, the Agency of Education for your yes. food program? The yes. CACFP program. Yes, okay. Oh, no, CFA. CACA Children and... Uh, Child and Adult Care Food Program. Okay, <laughs> but it comes through the Agency of Education. Yes. Yeah, okay. Because one of the things we've heard from them is uh, the trying to get more early childhood education programs into that program. Do you also get federal funding for your program? We don't. Okay. Um, the, are you? Oh, actually, we do a tiny, tiny, tiny for your food program. Yeah. Okay. Because that's an, uh, something we've been talking to them about is to how to draw down more federal funds for early childhood food programs um, by getting more of your types of programs into the food service, that just in general. But I don't know if there's more possibility for you to get federal funds through what you're already doing, but um, uh, that is apparently an opportunity waiting to happen. So thank you for your work. Did you say you're going to have a 1,000 square foot garden? 10,000. 10, 10, I mean, I'm sorry, 10,000, that's, that, 
I mean, 10,000. That's a quarter of a taker. That's amazing. And what I'm, I'm a little curious about the, the management of so that much. and like kind of the plan because this, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of involvement <laughs> with the kids and parents. Put the but, toddlers to work. Put the toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at the pack, you, when you have time, I invite you to look at the packet. The packet is a vision for our two-gen center that we are in the process right now of negotiating um, a grant and a loan with the USDA for a $1.4 million two-gen campus. Hopefully it will be open by uh, June and July of this year, and it's part of 10,000 square feet. So we have multiple programs. We have 10 programs. Our ECE program is just one of them. So we will, there's different sections of the garden, but we have a space that we encourage the parents to garden with their children. That goes into our food pantry, where the, we're just trying to create the motion and put the pieces together. But we are all, all of the staff are committed to um, food as health. So with the farm school grant and the planning that has um, been made possible, uh, we are beginning with um, some raised beds. So, um, you know, we're planning on beginning that this spring through funding with the farm school and also other, other funds. So it won't be 10,000 all at once. <laughs> and, uh, on that note, though, um, we, we are actively utilizing a farm at Timmins Springs or Timmins uh, right now. And so we have a high school program with teen parents who have babies. And so um, while the babies are in our ECE program, benefiting from the farm to school grant, the parents are gardening and farming at our, our team of wow. and so we kind of coordinate that back together. Wow. And uh, you run short of help doing <laughs> your garden, send the column or yeah. <laughs> Thank all of you for your time this morning. It was a, a great uh, show and tell program. I'm sure we came away with learning a lot. And hopefully we can help the practice school program. Ruth uh, and Chris's bill, uh, we're working on that. And hopefully that will proceed and, and uh, solve Hopefully we'll feed our children yeah. and our elders. Yeah. So thank you, thank you all very much.